Well, hello and welcome to this episode of Rock Nation. Uh, my guest today is Rochelle Chase, and Rochelle is the author of Creating, Creating the Black Utopia of Buxton, Iowa, and also another one called Lost Buxton. And so again, Rock Nation, uh, the, the podcast is an outreach of the Rock Center. And the mission of the Rock Center is to renew our city by providing services for our community with compassion, truth, and hope. And uh, we are looking for ways that we can encourage folks to have a new life, a new hope, and a new future. And um, I actually stumbled upon uh, the story of Buxton. I think it might have been a year and a half ago. Uh, and we are actually, I think I mentioned this to, to you, Rochelle, we're actually one of the halls that we have. We're not a big organization, but one of the halls, it's, it's Buxton Hall. And, and we want to have that, uh, have a presence here and tell that story. So as you introduce yourself, um, tell us a little bit about how did you get onto this subject of Buxton and, and what, what is Buxton and all of that? So take it away. Yeah, well, Buxton is a coal mining town that was established in 1900 by the Consolidation Coal Company, which was owned by the Chicago Northwestern Railroad. And it was really different from a lot of the coal mining towns, it just the town itself. But what it's most known for uh, pretty much is a difference in the people. Mm -hmm. because for most of its existence, it was 40 to 55% um, African-American. And not only were they, you know, there in Buxton, they were treated equal to whites and they were leaders of the community, doctors, lawyers, dentists, you know, pharmacists, educators. I mean, the list goes on. And that is really what, why this amazing story, the fact that this town existed in 1900 in Iowa, in the middle of farmland at a time when, you know, in a state that was 99.3% white or foreign born in a time where there was extreme violence and racism and unequal rights, um, you know, towards African-Americans. Well, when I just, you know, stumbled upon the story, I was living in San Francisco at that time. And my romance, I was writing romance and my romance writing instructor <laughs> lived here in Ottumwa. And she was like, oh, when you come visit us, well, we had become friends by this time. But she said, when you come visit, you know, we'll have to take you to this amazing town. What's left of it? So she took me out to the site and I will say we were walking through corn stalks and this was kind of like my first time really walking <laughs> through corn stalks. I mean, right. I see them from the freeway, you know, in California, yeah. but they were huge and it was like claustrophobic. And I was like, oh my gosh, are we ever gonna get there? So we get there and we get to what's left, the ruins. And again, they were telling me and I couldn't, I just couldn't believe it. So I just kept researching it. This was in 2008 and I would come visit and I would research and research and having no idea what I was gonna do with it because again, I was writing romance. And then I said, you know what? I gotta move to Iowa and write a book. So I moved here in 2014, Lost Buxton came out in 2017. And then I was like, oh, but there's so much more to tell. And then uh, Creating the Black Utopia of Buxton, Iowa came out in 2019. Oh, that, that, that's an amazing story. So where are you originally from? Oh, goodness. I went to like 14 different schools by the time I graduated um, from high school. So all over pretty much the West Coast, Alaska, uh, Seattle, or um, um, uh, Washington, um, California, pretty much, like I said, the West Coast. And um, then I moved here from San Francisco. Mm -hmm. What were some of the discoveries that you made along the way uh, about the community, the people, Talk to us about that. Just as, as you're doing your research, what were some of the, uh, without giving the whole book away, what were, yeah. what were some of the, the, the uh, just the aha moments, those things that just made you uh, uh, speechless? Well, I think it was, you know, I had listened to um, the State Historical Society of Iowa in Des Moines had about 75 or 80 interviews from people, recorded interviews from people that had lived in Buxton. And this was part of, you know, Dorothy Schweeter's work and um, her team, Joseph Araba and her husband and um, David Gradwall then wrote, and Nancy Osborne wrote a book as well, but they had done all these interviews as part of a grant and recorded them. And so I was listening to these stories and as people were talking about things, again, it was that time period, them talking about where they came from. Like some people mentioned that, you know, their grandparents used to talk about slavery and what it was like coming from the South from slavery, um, a time of slavery to Buxton. And to me, that was so 
it was just so amazing to hear someone talk about with like first, well, secondhand memories of, you know, what their parents or grandparents had said about this. So, and that, what that must have felt like adjusting coming from that to a place where it was so unique from any other place. So those kind of stories were very fascinating to me. Um, it was fascinating to also hear uh, from people, uh, white people who had really never been around black people, you know, and there were some, um, signs of racism. I'm not going to say Buxton, you know, was perfect sure. because people are bringing their own, you know, stereotypes and et cetera, but nobody acted according to residents. Nobody ever acted on that. You would just choose, okay, I'm not going to associate or, you know, I'm, but nobody caused problems, you know, if you had these, these, um, this mindset. So anyway, but going back to those who actually became friends, you know, that actually became friends with black people, had black neighbors, um, that had, again, never experienced this before. So those kind of stories were fascinating. And also just the number of professionals, the number of, you know, leaders in the community, the fact that there were so many Black people leading this town as well. They weren't, again, just residents, um, but they were actually active and, and leaders in the community. So these kinds of stories were just very fascinating to me. Now, if I, if I understand correctly, one of the individuals that was responsible for going to, um, I think, the, the South and, and retrieving workers had some connection with the Confederate uh, military, if I understood correctly, that um, he was actually from here. Is there some, is there truth to that or? Yeah, well, I discovered that, you know, this was at the time, the, the predecessor to, Bu to Buxton was Muchy or Muchakanic, it's pronounced different ways. Muchakinoc, people have pronounced it different ways. But that was started by the McNeil brothers in 1873, around that time frame when they started consolidating um, oil companies that, I'm sorry, oil, goodness, coal mining companies that they were buying in the area. And so they formed the Consolidation Coal Company. Well, they experienced some strikes in about 1880, um, 1879, and they then went to Virginia to recruit African-Americans, um, H.W. went. While he was there, it is believed that he met him while he was there, he met a man by the name of Shoemate. Shoemate, he asked him to do some recruiting for him and Shoemate actually ended up coming to um, Iowa and kind of getting the men situated. He was hired by the company. Well, I found out that Shoemate had been an ex-Confederate uh, soldier. And so that's one of the things that I am trying to research to see, okay, let me find out more about this guy. How on earth did he, did this connection happen? And what kind of a uh, how did he treat African Americans, you know, that were working, you know, in the mines. So that was an interesting little tidbit that I discovered. And another thing I discovered was a, how I found out about Shoemate in a little bit more detail in his role was I had stumbled across this court case, this transcript about, you know, 500 and some pages that I'm still kind of going through, where I guess when uh, the black men had arrived in Iowa, there was cuts versus coats. There was this, this election that was going on. And one of the gentlemen was accusing um, the, uh, the Consolidation Coal Company of uh, bribing the black men to vote and because they had lost. So, and the race was so close, mm -hmm. which sounds kind of familiar in yeah. some ways to what we just <laughs> something, went through. Some never change, do they? <laughs> So anyway, point is, um, there was information, testimony from Shoemate, you know, talking about how he got to the company, what his role was, that sort of information. So that's kind of the way I found out about him. Potential uh, third book uh, um, fodder, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and just, I just want to let folks know as well that uh, you can go out to Rochelle's, you have two websites, right? RochelleChase.com and then unitingthroughhistory.org. And uh, so also you, you give presentations, correct? What, what are some of the presentations that you uh, give around the country? And what's the, some of the subject matter? Yep, there's also lostbuxton.com, which is oh, where excellent. I also put additional things whenever I have time to research, I put them there. Um, but my presentations uh, have been, there's the overall, which is kind of, I consider the kind of like the cliff notes version of Buxton that kind of starts from start to finish. And what I like to do in my presentations is I've started dressing up in period clothing uh, to give these presentations. And I also include images and audio clips from residents that lived there. So I try to 
make it kind of a, a, a multimedia experience. So I give the, you know, start to finish kind of his history of Buxton. I've also done uh, one on the base, uh, the baseball team, the Buxton Wonders. Mm -hmm. um, not that I'm a baseball expert, expert, expert at all, but, you know, there have been some people that have asked, oh, you know, it's baseball season. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I've also been working, I, work, I want to work on one about the women of Buxton um, because there were, you know, variety of different occupations. Women had different occupations there in Buxton and they were also a very um, important part of the community. So that's one that I was working on before, you know, COVID kind of ended those presentations. So that's kind of a, a high level of what, of what I've been doing. Buxton. So in, in relationship to the activities from uh, this, this past summer, uh, and, you know, what, as it deals with, with race and race relations, um, how do you, what, what connection are you drawing and kind of what, what next step? What are you learning? Are there lessons learned from Buxton that uh, you're, you're transferring or discussing? What are some of those connections that you're making? I think, um, I think one of the one of the things that I'm, I've been, you know, kind of connecting with what's going on, you know, today in terms of, you know, some people have asked, you know, well, why did, why did Buxton, you know, work, especially considering the time period that it was in, the fact that you literally had clan activity in the farming communities surrounding Buxton, and yet and still Buxton is kind of this, this, I don't know, this surreal experience where people aren't doing what is going on, you know, in, in the surrounding areas and, and nationwide. And I think, again, part of that was leadership. Part of it was because Buxton was unincorporated, the superintendent, Ben Buxton, and before him, the McNeils, um, you know, they were kind of like the president, if you will, of the town in that they pretty much set the rules and said, this is the way it's going to be. According to residents, they did not tolerate um, racial, um, you know, violence. Um, they didn't, if you could not accept that, you know, you're going to be living next door to black people, white people, your kids were going to be going to school taught by black and white teachers, etc. You know, you were asked to move on. So I think the fact that you have that coming from leadership saying that this is the way this community is going to be, that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. I think the fact that you have people equal equal access to everything you know the things we've been fighting for you know today and throughout the last 400 years has been you know these this is the racism and the systemic racism that exists in this country that has you know created this in these inequities you know in housing and healthcare etc well in buxton because people had equal access to opportunities if you wanted to start a business you could there were 40 independent businesses you get a loan from the bank you could live in a company house or not you had equal wages, everybody had jobs, jobs were plentiful. And because it was a company that was, that supplied coal to the railroad, the men, the miners worked year round. There was, there were no layoffs in the early stages. So my point is, since you have also this even playing field where you have equal access, where people's needs, they can make as much money as they want to, as they're willing to work for. They have equal access to capital and resources. I think when you have this sort of environment, you don't have people fighting for this, these, the, the same equity, it's, it's equal. Yeah. So again, we can learn also what happens when you are today, or today, like the things that we're fighting for, the reasons why people weren't fighting for that in Buxton was because they already had it. Um, and then again, you can see also that it wasn't just Buxton, you know, Ben Buxton or the McNeil setting this, it was also because you had African Americans were the majority of the population, they also were creating this environment, they were leading this, they were governing, you know, uh, in governing roles in this town. So I think those are some of the things that, you know, to me, why you didn't have these things happening uh, then in Buxton and, and what you can learn from it. Were there any particular stories or convers in, um, situations that spoke specific, you know, spoke uh, certainly to you in, in during your research, any particular stories uh, uh, about the businesses or individuals um, that, uh, that really stick out to you? Um, I think, you know, I want to address that twofold the, in, in terms of the stories of the, you know, the residents that I heard 
versus the stories of people, you know, people have at, said to me, you know, that I've met, you know, doing these presentations. It has been very interesting to learn of the various connections, you know, that people have. Oh, my great grandfather, you know, lived in Buxton, et cetera, et cetera. But I have heard some things, for example, like, oh, my grandfather worked for after Buxton ended, you know, a black man went and formed a mine and my grandfather worked for him. So you have this person that, you know, the story of this, you know, white man that's working for this black man after at this time period. And, you know, it is said so matter of factly. So that was very, that was wonderful. Um, it was also stories of, for example, Lottie Armstrong was a, a black woman there at Buxton who had close ties to the company. Her father did as well. Um, she worked in the bank. She was actually a, I want to say on, she was on the board of directors I found and she had an SVP role on the bank and on, on the, in the bank. So again, this was something that would have been very rare for a black woman at this time, let alone a woman. Um, but somebody had said after that, oh, yes, my, I don't remember what relative, great grandmother, someone um, had actually, she was a, a farm girl in the community, had a sixth grade education, and Lottie Armstrong gave her a, a, a job at the bank, you know, as a, a teller, so to speak, taught her the ropes, taught her. So my point is these stories of people, you know, interacting um, the stories of, you know, people getting along, these, again, were very inspirational and they were very surprising to me. The people in Buxton, there were lots of, of notable people that came up. Lottie Armstrong, Hope Armstrong, which was Lottie's, you know, Lottie's father. He had very close ties to the, to the company, had, um, you know, uh, uh, owned property over 16, 1800 acres, 18 farmhouses he would rent out, had the large, the meat market, the meat um, company uh, that would deliver fresh meat to people. So there were just so many African-Americans as well. Dr. E.A. Carter, who one of the residents had mentioned delivered her, her um, brother. Again, this was a black doctor delivering white babies. And, you know, people, men were lynched at this time frame just for accidentally bumping into a white woman whistling, you know, whatever. So this to me was very surprising. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it sounds as that there were individuals that were willing to take a risk, a big risk. Yeah. Right? And it sounds like also you're saying that one of the reasons that it, uh, uh, it was successful was that there was no fighting for these things because they were providing, they, they were provided. And, right. and I think that's probably, again, reflective upon situation right now. There's the sense that we need to fight for these things because we don't believe that they are, are present uh, yeah. and available, available for us. Tell us a little bit about um, the, the nonprofit, Unity Through History. What, uh, what's happening with that? Because that's a, that's a relatively new uh, project for you, is it not? Yeah, Uniting Through History is literally brand new, meaning I am wrapping up on the website today. It goes live today. Um, it kind of, it came about because I was trying to figure out, okay, what can I do? Um, and really, to be honest, the, I've been thinking for a while, what can I do? What do I want to do with history? As, as I worked with Buxton again, and as I was researching all of this stuff that was happening in the world at that time and starting to realize all of this history, black history that I'd never learned about in school, um, some of it horrifying, um, and then some of it really great, you know, in terms of the contributions, the accomplishments. And I've been thinking, you know, well, what can I do with this? And then George Floyd, you know, when that happened, it was kind of this catalyst, like, okay, when I'm looking at, you know, just this, this, way this this kind of feeling that black lives literally don't matter and it's like part of this to me stems from the fact that we are never taught about the contributions black people have made to this country you know it is not part of our foundation and especially the real history and if it is it's told during black history month it's added as an afterthought right. in a textbook and so i just thought you know what i feel very passionate about this what can i do so uniting through history the mission for Uniting Through History was to, I wanted to further acceptance of and pride in the fact that black history is American history. And I wanted to do this by providing creative ways to really 
for people to really connect with the experiences of Black Americans. And I want to expand this to people of color, you know, indigenous people of color as well. But right now, because we are, it's a small, you know, very small staff, I'm starting with, with African American history. And so the projects that we're launching first, there's the Hip History Contest. It's for students, um, middle school to high school students to creatively bring the story of Buxton to life. Um, and to be, um, there will be a panel of celebrity judges and they will win, you know, $2,000, the top prize is $2,000, 15 of which is a scholarship for, for school. And then there's other prizes for second, third and along the way. So that's the big history pro or the big project for children out the gate. And that's starting, um, the website will be up next week and it'll be launched uh, in the first part of March. The next thing is a history book club. I looked for a history book club that, and I couldn't really find one that actually reads history books. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, and talks about them that focuses on people of color. So I thought, okay, I wanna start this because I wanna read these books, but I wanna make it more than just a history book club. I want to, to, to reading a book, I mean, yes, I wanna to try to get the author to come there and have a Zoom discussion, but I want every person to think about what can I do after reading this information individually? What can I do to help promote awareness of you know, this, this history and to combat racism? Because I really think that knowing this history, the history of people of color, it does make a difference in combating racism. So that's the third, second project. Third project is a longer term one. Uh, we've partnered with the University of Northern Iowa to work on a Main Street 360 project, which will be creating a virtual 360 experience where you can walk down the streets of Buxton and using images and photos, you can see what that was like. So mm -hmm. that's a bigger project that we're working with the University of Northern Iowa on. And there's a few other ones, but those are the immediate ones. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm sure, yeah, there's, there's uh, uh there's there's uh, certainly plenty of those yeah going through your your mind i, I can just uh, i can just imagine um as as uh you know we look going forward um how do we how do, how, how are how are you seeing groups individuals organizations maybe taking some of this and and taking some action because obviously that's that's what you're wanting to see right you're wanting to see somebody taking this information and not going geez, that was a great book or a great story. And, and I remember growing up, I grew up here in, uh, in Iowa and I knew of, you know, uh, George Washington Carver um, mm -hmm. because, and also because he went to, to Iowa State. Booker right. uh, you know, T. Washington, Martin Luther, you know, you know, those were the, as you talked about the history, that's, that's kind of who, who you were made aware of, you know, as yeah. growing up as far as history was concerned. And so, uh, excited about uh, that program with, with different books and, and learning more uh, about the contributions that African American individuals have made to, to this country. So what, what actions are you seeing and what actions do you hope people will take as a result of, of being exposed to, uh, to your works? Yeah, well, I can't really say what have they taken because this is literally new and we just picked the first book for the first month, which will start in May, in March, which will be Vanguard um, by Martha Jones, which we figured, you know, since it, you know, we just had, you know, the first, you know. Well, and I would also say just all of your work. So the presentations uh, and, and all of those things. Yeah, right. I think with the presentations, what has been really neat is it has been eye-opening, an eye-opening experience for people. You know, there's a lot of people I'm surprised who don't know about Buxton either that live here in Iowa. Um, and so getting this comprehensive picture from start to finish has, you know, really in, opened up their eyes um, to history here in Iowa, to the role that African-Americans have played, you know, in this. Um, and in terms of how they're taking that forward, um, to be honest, when I was doing those presentations and I was conveying this information, it was only after doing, you know, what, 80 of them and people, you know, coming up after and saying, oh my gosh, this is, you know, this is so great that it dawned on me, I've got this opportunity to get people to do more than just say, oh, that's great. So right. I've had this missed opportunity, which was kind of like the, the, the spark, you know, for Uniting Through History is like, oh my gosh, I could have been integrating this as part of my, my talks. 
So I can't say that I know for sure how people are taking that forward other than this awareness. And that again is why I thought, okay, I want to do more. Mm -hmm. I want to be clear though. There are, there's a lot of great work going on for people that are trying to like literally integrate, you know, black history into, into curriculum, that awareness. I don't have, you know, I'm not a historian. I don't have that background to say, okay, I'm going to do this. So my way of doing it is to try to partner with other people that have these programs, have these things going on, or the things that I'm aware of and come up with ways of which where I think we're unique is how do we immerse, how do we create programs that immerse people in that history that get them to really get it, to really connect with it? Because it's not a matter of just teaching something, it's getting people to connect with it so that they really say, oh my gosh, I didn't realize this. Oh my gosh, black history should be part of American history. Oh my gosh, I didn't know all this. So that is what we are trying to do is to come up with these programs, like I said, that really get people to get it. Well, I know we, we would love to have you on again when these you know, different projects are taking off and, and love to you know, connect your website with, with ours and promote uh, the, 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 uh, the HIP uh, project that, uh, that you have. That sounds like a, a fun one to get a lot of people and particularly uh, young people involved. Is, is that, would you say that that's uh, maybe a, a primary focus for you is, is the, the youth? Um, um, I, we, I wanted to have variety. Like the book club is for adults. Um, the 360 project will be for both. Um, the, this one is for youth. Um, I wanted to target the history, the contest to target youth, because a lot of times kids don't think of, or young people don't think of history as being fun. Um, yeah. It's dry, it's whatever, it's not real. And so again, this contest is gonna be different in that, excuse me, they get an excerpt um, from creating the Black Utopia of Buxton, Iowa, mainly because that's easy, because I have the rights to that. And then they actually have to just use this excerpt and that's, they don't even have to do additional research if they don't want to, but it's like, okay, you've got this excerpt and the excerpt is one that can, compares life for people outside of, of Buxton in the country with people in Buxton. So you can do whatever, whatever you want. You could create a script, you could create a hip hop song, you could create a, a voiceover with a dance routine. You could, I mean, whatever you want. Yeah. My, I, I tease my niece because I'm like, oh my gosh, she's always in the mirror putting makeup on or, you know, doing whatever. And I'm like, oh my gosh, enough. I said, hey, you could create a video putting your makeup on and talking about Buxton. So my point is, it's like whatever right. you want to do that's creative. She's not going to do that. She wants to do something else. I told her you can't enter the contest, but you can create a video. Um, so my point is, it's like, it's, I want it to be entertaining. I want it to be educational, but I want people to realize that history is real and it has practical implications and it doesn't have to be dry and boring. Yeah. Well, Rochelle, thank you so much for being a guest here on uh, Rock Nation podcast. And if individuals want to uh, connect with you, what's the best way? Go to the website or what might that be? Yep, go to the website, um, rochellechase.com, lostbuxton.com, unitinghistory.org, any of those, I am there. So wherever they, wherever they want. All right. Well, thank you so much again for being a part of the program. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.